Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Dan, and I have the privilege of opening the Word of God with you today. In particular, we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your copy of the Word of God, please go ahead and open that up now to Isaiah chapter 6. We're continuing in our summer series through the book of Isaiah, actually only going to chapter 12 in Isaiah. And as we come to Isaiah 6 today, we'll remember what Pastor Marty introduced last week as he surveyed Isaiah chapters 1 through 5. Last week, Pastor Marty introduced and addressed the theme of Isaiah 1 through 12, and that theme is this. Will you be a citizen of Babylon or Jerusalem? Who will be your king? And Isaiah 6 continues to ask the question of which king we will serve and what true surrender and service to that king looks like as we serve him. And so let's look now to Isaiah 6. We'll read it together and then a few comments out of it. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of his seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. But the holy seed is its stump. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, thank you for a wonderful time and privilege of singing your praises. We rejoice that we have the opportunity and the ability to call you holy to join with the heavenly hosts as they reflect your greatness through the word holy. And so, Lord, as we look at your word today, may we be laid bare before you with full hope, full promise, and full understanding that you will indeed heal us. And so, Lord, take this time, strengthen our hearts with it, and, Lord, may we be called to repentance and called to serve all the days that you give us. And we pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Isaiah 6, the king is dead. Isaiah, the king who reigned Judah for 52 years, has died. And Uzziah, the 52-year king, who led Israel and led Judah in such a way that they prospered and they increased and they experienced general peace is no longer on the throne. 
Isaiah has generally been considered a good king for Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 26 tells us that much. We are told that Uzziah had set himself to seek God. And in comparison to other kings of that time and era, that was a remarkable statement. In that under the reign of Uzziah, Judah prospered. And we're given a distinction in Second Chronicles that Judah prospered as Uzziah has sought the Lord. But not all that starts well ends well. And there's great danger in prosperity, isn't there? When the nation of Judah had experienced prosperity due to Uzziah, and Uzziah has experienced great success as a leader, there's a tendency in humanity to think that the prosperity that you have experienced is a result of your own ability, your own godness in some ways. And so for Uzziah, he grew strong and he grew proud. And in 2 Chronicles, at the end of his life, it is said that his pride was his destruction. Specifically, Uzziah's pride actually caused him to enter into the temple and attempt to light incense, a place and an act that was reserved for the priests, not for the king. And as a result of this brazen act, Isaiah was struck with leprosy and spent the remainder of his days not on the throne, but in seclusion. The king is dead. And as the king dies, the nation of Judah is in a precarious position. Not only now is there a question on who will be the king, the question is now regarding neighboring nations that are gaining strength in eyeing the nation of Judah. It's a troubling time in Judah. And it's troubling for Isaiah as a prophet as he pleads with Judah to see that just as Uzziah was proud and forgot the Lord, that this nation of Judah has become prosperous and has become proud and has forgotten the Lord. And just as Uzziah faced the judgment of God and the destruction by God, Judah is in danger in the midst of their pride to experience that same judgment and that same destruction. And it is with that in mind that we come to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, we're going to look at three specific scenes that are revealed in this chapter and identify what it is that Isaiah is calling the people of Judah and us to with regards of God being our king. What does it mean to call God king? And what does it mean to live with God as our king? And so let's go to scene one, verses one through four, the throne room of God. And in this throne room of God, we see Isaiah witnessing the permanence of God's reign. I, Uzziah has died. And you notice the next phrase that Isaiah utters is, I saw the Lord. This contrast of events is intentional. It's important for us to note why they are there. For Isaiah to say, Uzziah has died and the Lord is on his throne, and it is an immediate contrast to say, the king is dead, but the king reigns. And Isaiah is emphasizing that there's tremendous danger, there's tremendous temptation to pin your hopes on the temporary king in front of you and to lose sight of the permanent king who reigns on the throne forever. Leaders fail us, don't they? Leaders are temporary. But God's reign never ends. In Psalm 145, verse 13, another king mentions the reign of the heavenly king. King David says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And this is what Isaiah is meant to see as he enters into the throne room of God, and he sees God, look at your, script, your text with me, sitting on the throne, seated. It's an interesting detail, and it signifies that God hasn't moved. The throne is not vacant. The throne is full. And shall be filled. No one else reigns. Only God reigns. And his position is secure. 
and permanent. And his throne is high and lifted up. It's above all others. There are no other kings or rulers or leaders or political powers that can come close to his reign or usurp his right to reign. And so, Isaiah says, an earthly king has died. But the king reigns. And he sees then, as he progresses through the text, that the king reigns on his throne, and then he attempts to describe this king so that we might partake of this description. And he notices the magnificence of the presence of the king. Verse 2, or verse 1 and 2, we see one of the first things that he begins to note is the train of this king. The royal train fills the temple, overflows the throne, and fills the temple. And actually, it's not even the train of his robe. If you look in the little notes of your Bible there, you'll see it's also called the hem. The bottom of the train fills the temple. And in the time of the ancients, and even now, the status of monarchs was communicated by the beauty and the size of the robe and the train that the king or the royal figure wore. The royal train is a symbol of one's glory. And if the royal train is a symbol of one's glory, then we can see just by this description how glorious and how magnificent this king truly is. In 1953, Queen Elizabeth was inaugurated, was placed on the throne, and she had a robe and she had a train. Some of you may remember that or may have seen the video of it. The Queen Elizabeth's coronation robe had a train that was 14 feet long. It was beautiful and remarked upon, and articles have been written on it. The materials that were flown in to create this train. And it was meant to trail behind her as she walked, signifying the scope of her presence and of her impact. And even after she walked by, the train would trail signifying that her presence remains even after she has passed by. But Isaiah notes that the train of God is no mere 14 feet long, but fills the entire space of the temple. His robe and his train flows over the throne, filling any available space, consuming that space and filling it with the evidence of his grandeur. There is no space where the grandeur and the magnificence of God is not felt. There's simply no room for someone else's glory to be realized. And as Isaiah notes the train, he also then lifts his eyes and he sees the seraphim. And he becomes aware of these other creatures that are surrounding the holy God, the holy throne. And these seraphim are flying around the almighty God. And he notes in verse 2 the activity of these angels. Now seraph literally means burning ones. And so they are on fire as they surround the almighty God. And notice their activity with the six wings that they were given by their creator, the holy God. With two wings, they cover their eyes because no one can see the holy God. And with two wings, they cover their feet, a sign of humility, because no one should be proud in the presence of the holy God. And with two wings, they fly and they call to one another. And notice the specific activity of their service because this is an important thing to note. They called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There's only two times in Scripture where holy, holy, holy is mentioned here and in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And you'll notice in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, that it's another six winged creature that is doing the same thing. They're flying around the throne of God, pronouncing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You see, the worship of the seraphim never ends. It goes forever, and this is what their worship is, and it is sufficient worship to proclaim the holiness of God. 
I'm going to say that again because this is an important point. It is sufficient worship to call God holy. I wonder if you've ever felt yourself running out of words to describe God. Maybe you are in the midst of prayer and you're praising him in ways that you understand. You're praising him for his love. You're praising him for his strength. You're praising him for his justice. You're praising him for his mercy. But it isn't long before you run out of words, is it? And as you run out of words in your praise, you may feel in your heart there's more that you want to say about our God, but you have no words. It's in those moments when you've exhausted the comparisons of our world and experience with who God is that God has actually in his graciousness given us the word that perfectly describes him. And that word is holy. I wonder if you've thought about the uniqueness of that word. We don't use it to describe anyone else. God is utterly unique. He is in a class by himself, utterly set apart. He is higher than us and gloriously other. And so then we cry holy. And when we catch a glimpse of his intrinsic infinite value, we wonder and worship who else is like this God. We bow alongside the angels and we cry holy. God is holy. And his holiness is his godness. And so there is no more complete word to use to praise God than holy. He's not like anything else that we know or have experienced. And we have no ability to properly compare him to anything that is known. In Isaiah 40, 25, Isaiah writes, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. There is no comparison to who God is. And in 1 Samuel 2, 2, Hannah's prayer, she says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Now, his holiness cannot be described. Believe me, I spent all week attempting to do so. His holiness cannot be described, but his holiness can be displayed. Notice what the seraphim tell us in verse 3 regarding the holiness of God. In verse 3, they say the whole earth is full of his glory. See, God's holiness is displayed in God's glory. I read somewhere this week that the glory of God is God's holiness going public. God's holiness cannot be spoken of adequately, but it can be encountered in our universe, which is like a temple dedicated to display the glory of God. One commentator says, wherever we turn our eyes, we see marks of his majesty, that we should then lift our hearts in praise to him who is holy. And in this scene, Isaiah notes that the seraphim are doing just that. They are praising the holy God to one another. And note the reaction from the praise as they call out holiness. Look at verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. You see, when the creation of God praises their creator as they are created to do. And when his holiness is espoused, the ramifications of his holiness being praised are felt throughout the heavens. The foundations of the doorpost shake and smoke fills the room. The earth rejoices at the pronouncement of God's holiness. The heavens move when God's holiness is praised. And as we just sang a couple songs ago about the holiness of God, our voices join the heavenly chorus, pronouncing properly that God is holy. And the doorposts shake. We cannot fully understand or define the holiness of God, but we can most certainly pronounce and exclaim his holiness. And when a man 
comes into the presence of God, we see in Isaiah here that when a man comes into the presence of the Holy God and sees the true identity of the Holy God, then there's a response on his part in verse 5. And that takes us to scene 2, verses 5 through 7. Scene 1 is the throne room of God where the holiness of God is laid out before Isaiah. And scene five, or scene 2, verses 5 through 7, is Isaiah's response. And we see Isaiah on his face as he expresses his personal woe. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, if you look back just one chapter, you'll notice if you did a quick survey of chapter 5 that there are six times in Isaiah 5 where he pronounces woes on other people, on other people who are pursuing wickedness. But suddenly, though, because he's been exposed to the holiness of God, he realizes and comes to the expression that woe is me, I am lost. Or in your translation, it might say, I am undone. And in the Hebrew, that means I will cease to be. And when we are exposed to the holiness of God, the very godness of God, we cease the practice of defining our holiness by how, by how unholy other people are. And instead, our unholiness is defined by the holy God before us. And what's interesting in this is as Isaiah proclaims the woes upon himself, he says the reason for his woe is that he has unclean lips. The seraphim just previously had been praising God with pure lips. And as they praised, Isaiah's state of uncleanness prevented him from joining the chorus of praise to the holiness of God. And it isn't just that he has unclean lips, but rather the lips represent the whole of the person. And this is a common theme throughout Scripture. We see even Jesus himself in Luke 6.45 saying this, that the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Friends, your lips reveal the condition of your heart. And so I wonder what condition your lips reveal your heart to be in. And Isaiah goes on to emphasize that he resides among a people of unclean lips. No longer does Isaiah stand apart from the rest and pronounce judgment on them. He recognized the universality of all of humanity's sinful state before God. In Romans 3, 23, we know this passage. You've heard it before, but important for us to focus on right now. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory slash holiness of God. We are all lost before a holy God. It's a terrifying place to be in our sins before the holy God. One commentator said, In the presence of God, degrees of sin become irrelevant. It is the holiness of God which reveals to us our true condition, not comparison with others. I think this is a great reason why we don't take our sins seriously. Our churches don't, our culture doesn't, and we as individuals do not, because we often spend our days comparing ourselves to those that are worse than we are. However, in the presence of the holy God, sin is sin, and it's a terrifying place to be in your sin in the presence of this holy God. And so Isaiah is there and he sees the holy God and he has witnessed the majesty and the glory and the purity that marks the holy God. And out of that experience, the only response is one of personal recognition that he is undone. He is lost. And hear this, for the very first time in Isaiah's life, he understood who God is. And at the same moment that he understood who God is, this was the first moment that he finally understood who Isaiah was. It is only when you finally come to surrender to the holiness of God that you will finally see who you are. 
And he was a sinful man in the presence of a holy God. And in his mind, what was about to happen next was certain because he knows as well as you and I know that sinfulness and holiness cannot reside in the same place. Because holiness always consumes sinfulness. But what happens next is absolutely stunning. Rather than experiencing the consuming wrath of God, Isaiah experiences the consuming forgiveness of the holy God. Look with me in verses 6 through 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. If we can put ourselves in Isaiah's place at this point, as the seraphim is approaching us with a flaming coal and tongs in front of him, it is at this point that we expect annihilation to be our next experience. And there's biblical backing for that. In Numbers, we read of God's anger being poured out on the nation of Israel, and he came upon them in fire and consumed the camp. Because fire was typically an expression of the holiness of God in the face of a sinful people. And it was a sign of judgment and it was consuming of a sinful people. But this fire was different. This fire, if you look at the text, you notice this fire comes from the altar of God. And on the altar of God, this is the place where the holiness of God was accepted and satisfied by the death of a substitutionary sacrifice. And this act for Isaiah was God's initiative. Isaiah hadn't cleaned himself up suddenly, hadn't renounced all the bad things that he had done and the ways that he had offended God. He simply stated his position before God. Woe is me, I am a sinner before you, a holy God. And this was God's initiative to heal a man for God's glory. And Romans chapter 5 reflects this wonderful reality that because of God's work on our behalf, we can be reconciled, can be forgiven. Romans 5, 8 through 11 tells us this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, was sacrificed for us, and so since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And this cleansing, atoning work by God to Isaiah happened in one fell swoop, didn't it? The coal touched the lips. Those lips that were pronounced unclean by Isaiah had now been pronounced clean by the ministering angel of the Almighty and the Holy God. You see, Isaiah had been brought into this terrifying place, the presence of the Holy God, to realize his sinful condition and to realize God's forgiveness and consuming forgiveness over his sin. And I say to you today, the presence of the holy God is a place of forgiveness when you recognize your sinful space before him. Exposure and surrender to the holiness of God will result in confession of our total sinfulness and we will receive the grace and mercy of the holy God because he gives it to us. Which leads us to the third and final scene, verses 8 through 13. This third and final scene, we see Isaiah now is a man on God's mission. Verse 8 and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This verse is the first time God speaks in this narrative. Because prior to this moment, Isaiah wasn't ready or able to hear the voice of God. 
But now, because of God's initiative to heal the sinful Isaiah, he who was once far off could not hear God, has been brought near to hear God's voice and to hear God's call. You see, when we are transformed by God's work in our hearts, the next reality for us is this. The defining purpose for our days, for my days, for your days, are transformed by the very grace that has transformed our soul. Our purposes are to make much of the God who has redeemed and transformed us. When you have witnessed the holiness of God, when you have been transformed by his forgiveness, there is no other answer than yes, here I am, God. Yes, I will serve you. Yes, I will live out my days to speak for you, to represent you, to exhaust myself to the end that your glory is shown and revealed. There is no other answer once you have experienced the holiness of God and the forgiveness by God. And Isaiah's words, here I am, are powerful, aren't they? Because they represent an immediate, conditionless availability. I wonder if in light of all that God has done for you, as you've been exposed to his holiness and as you've experienced his forgiveness, if your mouth utters, here I am, or do you find yourself saying to God, not that far and not just yet. If we find ourselves placing limits on the extent that we are willing to go in the service of the holy God, then I fear that we may not be fully surrendered to him. And if we've not been transformed by his consuming power of his holy grace. And the message that we see God give to Isaiah is no piece of cake either. In verses 9 through 10, Isaiah now is given the message that he is to proclaim Just look at this wonderful message that Isaiah has given. Go and say to the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It's a brutal message. This is a message that God is telling Isaiah to tell to a people that is going to reject the message and reject the messenger. This message is not one of encouragement and affirmation. It's the message that Isaiah himself just lived and experienced. It's the message that there's a holy God and you are sinful and you need to repent. And out of his graciousness, he will forgive you. And you need this forgiveness and you need his newness of life. And he will be your God and you will be his people. That's the message. But that message is offensive. And people reject it, and that very message will make people harden their hearts to it. And it leads Isaiah in verse 11 to say to God, How long, O Lord? (laughs) Maybe you've said that. It's a reflection of the difficulty of this message, of this task sharing the gospel time and time again to people that continually reject it and we face a choice. Do we just stop and give up and quit or do we persist? I wonder if you've said this, oh God, how long will my heart be broken for the sins of my friends and family? How long, oh Lord, will my family members continue in their lives to seek pleasure but only experience emptiness? How long, oh Lord, will I tell the gospel good news And be rejected, mocked, or thought less of how long, O Lord. In verse 11 through 13, God looks at Isaiah, even as we read it right now, and he doesn't say, change your message, try again. Just do it once and you'll be good. No, he tells him this, continue to deliver the message until his plan is complete. Brothers and sisters, there is no end to delivering this message on this earth. If you have experienced the holiness of God and are transformed by the grace of God, then your day's purposes are transformed in accordance. The rest of your days are now to be lived proclaiming the message that transforms you.
And so throughout this chapter, Isaiah is reflecting to Judah and to us on what it means for God to be truly king. Three summary points quickly. When God is your king, you are exposed and surrendered to his reign. His holiness consumes you. I wonder, brothers and sisters, do you marvel at the holiness of God? And when God is your king, his holiness leads you to confess your unholiness. And when God is your king, the depth of your unholiness and faithlessness is seen for what it really is, an offense against the reign and rule of the holy God. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we mourn the effects of our sin more than the offense of our sin against the holy God. And thirdly, when God is your king, the forgiveness we receive as we surrender to his holiness results in a life lived in obedience to his calling. When God is your king, your days are not measured in minutes, hours, or years, but in opportunities to faithfully live for the glory of the holy God. I wonder, brothers and sisters, is this how you view the purpose of your life? Is God your king? I have wonderful news. He can be. Because exposure to God's holiness and forgiveness by the grace of God will result in a transformed life of service for God and for his glory. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do come before you and we proclaim even as is happening around your throne right now that you are a holy. And while we can't fully grasp the reality of your holiness, we can sense it in our heart and our being and we can see the glory of your presence even in the world around us. And we recognize that you are God and we are not. And so we throw ourselves at your mercy, confessing our sin, trusting you for your forgiveness, And we ask that you would count us worthy, Lord, to live the rest of our days for your glory and for your praise. And so, Lord, even as we sing to conclude our time today, receive our praise, work in our hearts, transform our purposes. In your name we pray. Amen.